This video is part 3 of me explaining Cowboy Bebop. The other parts are in the description and on my channel if you want to check those out first. Oh look, episode 14 is on the horizon. Here I go, fading into the distance to be drowned out. Spike domes a fella, so does Faye, and also Jet. Back at the Bebop, everyone is peeved. Mysterious chess pieces were found on the thugs they just tried to capture, and no sign of their boss. Meanwhile, at the Abstract's pyramids, a mega CEO is frustrated by the Bounty Hunter Association's lack of progress. The TV reveals that a reward is only given to hunters who find the mastermind behind the hyperspace gate attacks. The crew discuss their situation, and a wrinkly old guy wiggles his finger somewhere, causing another gate to be sabotaged. They decide to exchange information to make this goose chase a little less foul. The personal credit card details of all who pass through hyperspace are harvested by the perpetrator, and all the goons who are caught seemingly have nothing in common. Faye snatched an advertisement for thievery equipment from her target. Spike deduced that the mastermind must be connected to the gate corporation, and Ed electrocutes herself while chewing on some cables. She figures out that the chess pieces are hosts to an online game. Jet quickly synthesizes their findings, tells Ed to continue playing chess, and goes to talk with the gate folks. Ed makes a move. The enigmatic elderly guy is delighted. Sneaky listening spy device planted successfully. Jet explains to the gate CEO that this whole ordeal is part of a big game and points out that the police should be involved if there is an actual problem. The big boss doesn't like that so much and ejects Jet from his office. Later, through espionage, Jet finds out about Chessmaster Hex, a relic of 50 years ago, who resurfaced to cause havoc. This bozo listens in on the spicy deets. Hex and Ed continue to fiddle with their pieces as Spike and Faye analyze their own. Ed does gymnastics in excitement. Jet gives them all the scoop through FaceTime. Ed goes for the classic chess strategy of the Bulgarian's left bollock, sending Hex into a giddy fever. His parrot is also elated. Spike reads a Wikipedia article stating that Hex was the man who created the central control system for all the hyperspace gates. He was fired from the Gate Corporation for doubting the safety of his own invention. Faye attempts to get Ed to touch grass, but Ed doesn't know what grass is to begin with. Ed reveals that Hex has been playing chess with her this whole time. The crew is suited up and ready to deploy to Hex's location. He lives in Sci-Fi Blight Town, a lawless city created by a rat king of obsolete gates, scrap, and spaceships. They get going, cautiously fluttering through the various piping, scaffolding, and rubbish to the sedative melodies of upbeat jazz. This freak show shows up to ruin the mood with his brazen tactics. Spike and Faye wander the labyrinthian passageways, discovering a colorful array of wildlife speckling the city's interior. The whole city is zooted out of their gourds on space hash. Hex and Ed's game comes to a climax, as the hunter is converted Hex cares not for violence, as his last neurons yearn only for chess, and he summons the homies to witness his ultimate battle. The twice uninvited guest has a mental breakdown and goes ballistic. He is pacified by Spronk. Jet explains to the Gate Corp CEO that this was all set up by Hex 50 years ago when he was upset about being canned. Herps is now just a senile chess lover, living his best life peacefully out there in Space Slab City. Jet uses the leverage of insider information to convince the big wig to leave Hex alone, keeping Ed's happiness in mind. Speak of the little devil, who has been playing chess for weeks straight. All is well in the drifting city. This guy smokes a fatty. Ed loses her game. Hex is fulfilled and probably dies here, I think. I don't know. A nude woman bathes in a crate while astronauts watch. Edward tries to eat a polluted frozen fish. Jed is off to catch a minuscule bounty while Ed is in search of a kebab. Ein wakes Faye up with his massive greasy dog farts and reminds her of someone from her past. I guess that's Faye all gooped up in some cryostasis gunk. She is awakened by Dr. Bacchus, who immediately admits to drowning millions of people. He also reveals that Faye now owes $30 million for her stasis and an extra 54 years of interest from the storage costs. That explains a lot about her character all of a sudden. Nurse Apathy estimates the cost at around 300 million shekels. Faye has unfortunately fallen victim to the United States healthcare system and must now serve a life sentence of indentured servitude to pay off her debts. That will be difficult considering that Faye lost her memory and doesn't know what debt is anymore. Her cool lawyer, Whitney Haggis Matsumoto, comes to her rescue to catch her up to speed on the last 54 years. 
years. She was put into cryostasis because of injuries she sustained that could not be cured with the technology of the time. Whitney flirts every other sentence and reveals her ignorance of modern times. Faye becomes aggressive, demanding that she be fully aware of who she was and what accident placed her in such a circumstance. She passes out. Later that night, she escapes into the forest, becomes afraid of technology, runs around on the highway, is chased by her lawyer, and ultimately caught. She admits that her only option is to run away from her debt and old self. Whitney begs to differ and proffers the hand of friendship. Faye folds in his carried Yoda style. There is some kind of romantic montage where the two develop feelings and go on cute dates. Now they're being mercilessly pursued by a debt collection agency. Walter makes a swift escape and urges Faye to rendezvous with him at the hospital. Away they go, oh, he died. And now his dead is Faye's. Classic. Back in the present, Ayn was killed by Faye's soliloquy. Spike emerges from laying an egg. He heard it all and scolds her for running away, but his hypocrisy falls on deaf ears. Jet brought a fat guy on board who looks familiar. It's whiny. Faye demands an explanation. He wanted to start over, so he settled on matrimonial fraud. Classic. He is repentant, if nothing else. Jet expresses his anxiety about leaving Faye alone with her ex. The police show up to take Whitney to jail. Meanwhile, he still has Riz. Faye frees his cuffs and begins to flee. Winnie is unable to fit into Faye's diminutive spacecraft. Spike and Jeep swim over to investigate and are threatened. They believe she has gone mad with lust. Faye fires an obligatory gunshot, stuffs the Hindenburg into her car, and flies away. She forcefully inquires about her past once again, but is interrupted by Spike's projectiles. They dogfight a little bit. Whitney's flabby flaps wobble from the magical space G's. Spike launches a couple flares and gently nudges the underside of Faye's vehicle. Faye is distraught about her past. Wadey doesn't know anything either and is aggressively fondled. Words of wisdom are carried through space into her boat. They answer Faye's question of who am I? The voice states that the pursuit of self-understanding is a foolish endeavor meant for adolescents and those who are bored. The owner of those words was Dr. Bacchus, who is currently posing as a police officer. Faye is enraged. Bacchus reveals that he gave her the surname Valentine and that all data was lost in the hyperspace gate explosion of 22. The real police show up, causing Bacchus to skedaddle in a most fashionable way. Whitney is placed behind bars at last, but manages to utter one last flirtation as a goodbye. His whopping bounty of $19 is shared equally among the crew of the Bebop. There is a hallway full of meat puppets made by this guy, who also murders this poor bottle of booze. They live in a flying Thompson. Faye is enraged while Jet does botany. He gets a phone call from a man named Fad, causing him to stoically hold the butt end of a lit cigarette. Faye questions Jet about fixing his awesome robot arm. He is displeased with her meddling and retaliates. The corpse littered drum magazine was a death row transport, which was hijacked by its cargo. The felons are predictably aggressive. Gus Fring established a hierarchy among the prisoners. He's an assassin for the syndicate named Udai. Jet meets up with his old pal Fad, an ISSP officer who picked a bad week to quit smoking. He informs Jet of the escaped convicts and Udai's liberation, implying that he is on the case. Jet warns Icarus of his wax wings, only to be deflected by Fad bringing up the past. He's displeased with the truth of Fad's words, sulking away into the distance. He reflects on the past, back on the bebop. In pursuit of Udai, Jet fell into his trap, presumably losing his arm in some kind of freak explosion or something. Meanwhile, Udai is too silent to lead, so Scarface takes over the pilot seat. Jet prepares to confront his past once more, while instructing Ed to tend to his bonsai should he never return. Udai creates a trap for the police under the disguise of an inoperational vessel in need of emergency rescue. He remains emotionless in the face of brutality. The police's flock of boats are reduced to giblets. Fap and Jed scrounge the battle site for clues, deducing that Udai will return to Europa to make contact with the Syndicate. Fad is impressed. Ed moistens Jet's little trees and tells Spike that Jen is not returning. Spike is confused. Udai is rejected by his dad over Skype. Fad tries to recruit Jet into the police force as he departs. Jet begins the assault by going fast. The prisoners are packing mad heat, however. He struggles to find an opening to infiltrate amidst the gunfire, but latches on with his projectile appendage. Fad crashes his car into the prison bus while Jet makes a bold entrance. Udai understands that he has a personal guest 
and equips his weaponry. I think this guy gets sucked into space. Jed is lost and is then engaged by Udon in a frantic gunfight. Thad has also boarded the galley and unloads his iconic six-shooter. Jed is overpowered by Udai's judo and is questioned on his return. He states that his lost arm yearned for revenge, then takes a knife to the leggy. Udai reveals that Jet's arm was taken by his own partner, Thad. He is shook. A flashback demonstrates that Fred laid the trap which led to Jet's downfall. Okay. Udai is Uded. Jet questions Thad's reasons for betrayal. He responds by bitterly expressing his loyalty to the syndicate. A suspenseful shooting ensues. Thad never pulled the trigger. He requests one last Siggy and goes to dine with the Aesir in Valhalla. The Bebop is out of food once more. Someone stole Jet's sweet roll. The entire ship and crew have been deprived of sustenance, adrift in space, for two days. Tensions are high to say the least. Oh, what's this? A bean for Ed? Scorn. Impact. Yoink. They crashed into another spaceship. Jet attempts to exchange insurance information, but fails. The collision altered their trajectory, so now they're doomed to wander the deserts of Westworld. Faye ate Jet's gross expired sweet roll and becomes soulbound with the porcelain throne. S and J begin fixing the bebop's intestines and send Ed to scavenge for food. She has a great time looking for stuff, chasing a car, sniffing around on the ground, and scampering along the highway. Melon Man has melons. But melons cost money. Afro babe Tokyo drifts into view and purchases a melon with her sweaty boob money. She is on the hunt for a thumb with a boater hat. Ed followed the sweet scent of adventure into the lady's bicycle as some guy conspicuously pulls a corpse around in town. Afro babe is pulled over for questioning by the police. She is a bounty hunter on her way to bag a mushroom salesman for being naughty. They inspect her trunk, find Ed and Ayn, and immediately arrest her while the duos link away. Double E stumbles across the mush peddler and assault him for his bagel. He is confused. An enemy stand user emerges to extract revenge against him. His box is flattened by Truck Coon. The dealer sold trench coat some jank shrooms and his brother exploded as a result. Speaking of mushrooms, some scrumptious morsels just happened to fall out here on the floor. Yoink! Ayn is zonked out. Ed drugs up the whole crew with these funky fungi. They all start tripping something fierce. Spike is beckoned into heaven. Faye experiences the wibble wobbles, and Jet talks to his beloved plants. Spike goes on to have a conversation with a little frog. Faye becomes a toilet fish, and Jet learns the secret of the universe only to forget it a moment later. The TV reveals that the mushroom merchandiser's name is Domino Walker. Ed decides to embark on a bounty hunt with Ayn in tow. Diana Ross escapes from the police in pursuit of Ed and Ayn. The geezer patrol heralds the coming of chaos. Ed stumbles across the hidden run ship from earlier, which coincidentally contains enough magic mushrooms to let God see himself. Ed goes for his any spy kids move with stink gas and a chase ensues. Domino's makes a getaway on the path train. Trenchcoat hijacks Melon Man's hot rod, while the background jazz vocalist recites the names of random countries. They duel atop the train as Afro Babe cruises up in her convertible. Ed uses her dome as a ramp and six Ed on the criminal, which begins a Rube Goldberg-like series of events, where Ed eventually captures her quarry, who gives her shrooms in exchange for his freedom. Ayn expresses gratitude towards a cow for stopping the train. When the crew finally come down, Spike nearly made it to heaven. Faye is tangled in toilet seaweed, and Jet was eating lipstick in the ventilation shafts. Ed proudly presents her reward to the crew. The police arrive to do a quick inquiry about the wanted man. Ed is eager to reveal all, but Jet and Faye are quick to silence her. Spike emerges from the tent with the shrooms, which test positive for shiitake. The crew partake in a delicious banquet of varied mushroom delights. Faye gambles her life savings away at the horse races. Jet recites an old fantasy tale to Ed and Spike when a weird bug descends from the sky. Faye regrets her decisions. The tiny helicopter delivered a package meant for her. She pieces out, thinking that someone with a grudge may be out to get her. Spike and Jeff contemplate what foul trickery may lay within the inner wrappings. Spike disregards the potential for an acid attack and proceeds to uncover a VHS tape from the early 2000s. They are 
confused. Spike begins to tear the VHS's intestines out. Ed does some whiz -biz on her PC and finds that the mystery box was sent on a journey through the entire solar system. It originally embarked from a time before the gate explosion. Spike and Jack go to sell the tape, of course. They seek out a vintage video equipment vendor who loves K-dramas. Spike damages the relics, receiving a brief scolding from their proprietor. Jack gets the nerd fired up about old tech, and he prattles while Spike vandalizes more equipment. They get to see what ancient secrets it holds. It's b-roll footage of nature, and a girl staring out into the ocean. The tape starts to be eaten by the player, which causes Spike to mercifully put it down. Meanwhile, Faye gambles her life savings away again. The Radio Shack employee is understandably upset, but will unfortunately not be getting any justice today. Ed discovers the location of another video player compatible with their cassette. Faye wins big at the dog races and is abandoned, while Ed informs her that the Bebop is going to Earth. Faye's banana suit sticks out in a crowd. Looks like it's delving time for the boys. The player is somewhere in a massive labyrinthian building full of all kinds of post-apocalyptic hazards, like elevators, for example. Spike and Jet crawl around the building for a while, encountering miscellaneous obstacles along the way. Faye loses her life savings at the dog races. The treasure hunters find their prize after many trials and begin the wade back. They got the wrong antique and are reasonably bummed. Faye has a video chat with Ayn. <laughs> <sighs> Just stretching is all. Ed takes over telecommunications, and Faye inquires about the situation. Ed doesn't make any things any clearer. Then Faye decides to return to the Bebop. A mailbot delivers another package for Faye, which is opened immediately by Spike. It's somehow exactly what they were looking for. They all gather around to communally view the prehistoric recording. Jet banishes Faye from the viewing party because she owes him money. Once more, the video reveals archaic details of the past. Faye sneaks a peek. The footage transitions to a group of schoolgirls, they all decided to make a time capsule for themselves to open in 10 years. This little cretin looks familiar. Faye looks on from the darkness. The girl urges her adult doppelganger to meditate in the present, then addresses her thoughts on what the future could hold. Continuing on, she apologizes for always troubling the people around her, and does a full-hearted cheer for her future self. That very self looks on with a melancholy stare while she contemplates her identity. Spike is stranded in a desert. The Bebop is on the hunt for pirates, trying to lure them in by floating Faye around. Spike is chilling in the heat when he is picked up by an obnoxious baseball fanboy named Miles, instead of the old guy he expected. Spike naps to the soothing sounds of Miles' chatter. He is awoken by Miles, commenting on his ship, the Swordfish. Spike is enraged. They eventually make it to the hangar where Duhan has been vigorously fixing an old NASA spaceship. The pirates that Jet and Faye are after slurp up a shuttle of some kind. Instead of Faye's ship, they are intercepted by the hunters. Faye is confident, but her ship is mind controlled by the pirate's noodly hook arm. Jet bears the brunt of Faye's carelessness. The Bebop gets injected with the strange technomancy, but Ed quickly resolves the issue. The space pirates bought enough time to skedaddle before the pan got too hot. Meanwhile, in the Sahara, Spike idles around while Dooley fiddles with his boat. Miles gets a little too uppity for the old man and is slain for his tomfoolery. Spike and Duhan discuss Stork's attachment to the swordfish. Spike calls Faye to check in with things. Jet reveals that the Bebop has robo-aids now and can't fly anymore. The pirates are selling their ill-gotten parts around where Spike is. Very convenient. Jet is adamant on revenge and bribes Spike into assisting by waggling Duhan's invoice. He has a plan to counter the virus by disabling the parts of the spaceship it affects, mainly navigation and communications, which means using an old radio signal for comms. Spike is unenthused but gets going. Two of the trucks they are looking for appear out of the gate. Spike and Faye don't mind firing at potentially innocent civilians and figure that the bounty will probably run, whereas the former would not. They both flee and are pursued by the hunters. Faye caught some no good fare evaders instead of a bounty. The communications between Jet and Spike are relayed to Miles through his personal baseball radio. Spike catches up with the pirates and evades their hazardous appendage. The pirates absconding rectangle sheds its facade, revealing a devil 
devilish Hawacha of RoboAid's missiles. Spike manages to avoid most of them, but is overwhelmed and must resort to using the Force from now on. One of the pirate's hooks veers off course and injects their own vessel. Miles informs the old man of Spike's current perils. Spike laments the damages to his newly refurbished ship, but continues with preparations for a manual extraction. Spike is agile. The pirates explode, sending a deluge of dirty needles everywhere. The Bebop is unable to intercept due to the space debris. Duhan intends to take the old relic off to save Spite from incinerating in the Earth's upper atmosphere. Spike accepts his demise and reveals his secret stash of booze to Jet. All is not lost as Doobie hollers on the radio. It's launch time for his pimped out ride. Miles is in a tank. Duhan inspires Spike by re-entrusting him with the swordfish and has a spectacular launch. Spike struggles to gain control, but sacrifices pieces of the wreckedy racer to delicately plop into Duhan's hoary rocket like a hot dog in a bun. Unfortunately, that rocket has quite a few failing parts now, putting them entirely at the mercy of Earth's gravity. The pictures on Duhan's wall reveal that a pretty memorable event happened that day. And that's the end of part 3 of Cowboy Bebop. Hey, thanks for watching. Uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. I have a Patreon if you want to toss me a few doubloons. Uh, links to stuff are in the description if you're curious. Thanks again. Uh, bye.